The title of this message, hopefully it will come up on your screen, maybe not, stunned, stunned by his mercy. Stunned, or he could be astonished, astounded, startled, overwhelmed, staggered, flabbergasted, blown away, or taking one's breath away. I don't know about you, but the more I walk with Christ over the weeks, days, months, and years, it seems to me that I'm stunned more and more. I'm marveled by his mercy and marveled by his abundant grace in my life. Whether it's just my old, the older I get, you see the sinfulness, you see your own nature, and you see actually such mercy has been poured out into my heart, and I cry out, Abba, Father. Maybe it's because of my own mortality. Maybe as I reach into my, yes, believe it or not, 50s. Wow. Were you stunned? Were you flabbergasted? Hey, I've got a good DNA. The DNA of Christ is eternal. He makes new things every morning. Hallelujah. Maybe because my own mortality and that I'm finite and understand that I live by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the scripture reveals that he is very merciful. The scripture reveals that he's full of compassion, abounding in mercy. And if we really want to know God, and I, I don't know about you, but I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. If we really want to know him, if we really want to pull back the curtains and gaze into the chambers of his very heart, it's not to display his just wrath and maybe his celestial power, which are phenomenal, but it is to look upon his mercy, is to look upon his grace is to look upon the life-changing panorama of His glory and His grace and His mercy shine as the apex of this glory. The scripture reveals that He is infinite, unchangeably, unfailingly merciful. We know, don't we, in Ephesians chapter 4, 2 verse 4, it says, But God, who is what? Rich in mercy because of His great love, by which he loved us. We see through the scripture that the English word mercy appears over 341 times in the Bible. The four Hebrew and Greek words for mercy appears over 454 times in the scripture and can be translated kindness, love and kindness, goodness, favour, compassion and pity. And looking at the whole narrative of the scripture, we see that mercy is extended to the offender in the form of forgiveness, to the sufferer in the form of healing and comfort. Mercy can be translated as compassionate treatment of those in distress. Have we had those in this building today who have been in distress, who have suffered under the sin and the shame and the hurt and pain of this world. Whether the stress is caused by the, my own guilt or our own guilt or the penalty of sin or by the unbearable physical condition, mercy is infinitely always there to be poured out Amen. on humanity. Like Simon or someone saying, he's waiting for mercy, to give us mercy. You see, I am a man. I am a man stunned, astonished, astounded by such mercy in my life. Mercy is forgiving the sinner and withholding the punishment we justly deserved. The scripture reveals that we've all sinned, haven't we? We've all fallen short of the glory, the apex of his glory. And there's none righteous, no one. Now we all stand guilty before our holy God. And the scripture reveals that the soul that sins shall die. None of us, even the most educated, successful among us, or the most prosperous or the most disciplined among us can boast in their own righteousness because his righteousness endures forever or our own perfect humanity. Therefore, I would like to this morning brief, briefly peer 
into the heart of our Saviour, into the heart of God, if we can, and glimpse of his fatherly heart towards us, that we would again turn and reveal the fresh revelations and be stunned, be astonished, be overwhelmed by such mercy in our life. And number one, the first person I look at is Moses. Moses saw the mercy of God. Moses saw the mercy. One of the most important passages in the Bible is Exodus 33 verse 19. I'm not sure we can get it on the screen, but I'll just show it you. As Moses presented himself before the Lord and asked him to show him his glory, God answered this in Exodus chapter 33 verse 19. I will make my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim my name before you, the Lord and I will be gracious to whom I am gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. When asked to show him his glory, God reveals his goodness. God reveals his mercy. God displays amazing grace. When we think of his glory, we may have ideas and thoughts, and I had that in my past, impressions of what this glory may be like. But God reveals his glory in his mercy and his abundant grace because he has chosen us to be merciful to. In a few chapters or a few verses later, the Lord descended upon Moses in the mountain of Sinai and passed before him and proclaimed this in Exodus 34 verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for a thousand, forgiving iniquity and the transgression of sin. Moses saw the mercy. Moses was stunned by the mercy of God. While he was up in Mount Sinai, the people were building a golden calf of idolatry. Yet he was up on the mountain being stunned being mesmerized, being awestruck by the glory which is revealed in his mercy. The first greatest truth for his people in scripture was that God is merciful and God is gracious. A.W. Tozer, who's a great man of God in the 40s, 50s and 60s in America, he said this, mercy is the goodness of God confronting human suffering and guilt. Were there no guilt in the world, no pain and no tears, God would yet be infinitely merciful, but his mercy might be well hidden in his heart. Unknown to the creatures of the universe and the created universe, no voice would be raised to celebrate the mercy which none felt the need of. Yet it's human misery and our sin that calls forth the divine mercy of Christ. Divine mercy of God is in our sin, it's in our pain, it's in our hurt, it's in our shame that calls forth from the chambers of his heart the mercy of God and the mercy of our Saviour. See, Moses saw the mercy and it says he hid in the cleft of the rock. I pray, like myself, that I'll be stunned, awestruck, overwhelmed, speechless, when I'm in touch with the mercy of God. The second man I want to look at is David, King David, because Moses glimpses about the merciful God rightly because he became a leading revelation in Israel. It will be remembered even as the people turned their backs from him. Because it says in Chronicles, the Lord God is gracious and merciful. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. The prophets celebrated that he's gracious and merciful. The book of Psalms, which David writ over 23, 73 of these Psalms, are full and soaked and drenched and anointed in the mercy of God. David, Israel's greatest psalmist king, the man after God's own heart, would cast himself utterly on the mercy of God. After his sin, we know this, the story of the sin of Bathsheba. It says when kings were out to go out to war, he said David stayed at home. And when David stayed at home, he went out on his balcony and saw a beautiful woman. 
when he should be at war, he should be on the battlefield with the rest of his troops, he stayed at home. And went out on his balcony and saw a beautiful woman, Bathsheba, and took him, took her to his bed and sinned greatly. He tried to cover his sin by bringing home Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, from the battlefield. But Uriah was such a loyal servant to King David, he didn't go and sleep with his wife. He stayed outside and waited because his men were on the battlefield. David sent him to the battlefield, sent him to the front line on the battlefield, and there Uriah was killed. What loyalty from Uriah, but what sin from David. A man after God's own heart. But later on, in Psalm 51, David was stunned by the mercy of God. And David fell on the mercy of God. Of God. And Psalm 51, we know, is one of the famous psalms. I think my favorite psalm, maybe because I fall on this mercy every day. It was his lament and repentance and urges God to have mercy on him and take not his Holy Spirit from him according to his love and kindness, according to the multitude of his mercies. He said, I cry out, please blot out my transgressions. You see, David fell on his mercy. And later in life, as David was accomplished much great, uh, accomplishing great um, triumphs on the battlefield with other nations, he wanted to make a consensus or census. And there he, he I think he, he commanded his commander of the army to go and count all the men of war. And 800,000 men were were counted in Israel, who were good with the sword, and 500,000 were counted in Judah. So that's 1.3 million trusted soldiers and warriors. And there David sinned greatly because he then started to, to lift himself up above the power and the mercy and the greatness that is God who gives the increase. It God who gives the, the victory in his battles. And there the prophet Gad, I think, came to him and gave him Three options of the judgment upon his life. But David glimpsed into the heart of God and he knew where he was to fall. He said this in response to the words from the prophet. He said in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 14, he says, Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. When David had sinned greatly, when David lifted up his pride and arrogance uh, towards God and the judgment came, David cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. Let me not fall into the hand of man, but let me fall into your gracious, merciful hand. I pray, let us be like David when confronted with our pride, when confronted with our failings, when confronted with with our weakness, we fall like David on the mercy. And what comes out of our heart is not pride or arrogance. What comes out of our heart is what came out of David's heart. He said this in Psalm 51, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than the snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. David, when confronted with his sin, fell upon the mercy of God. And there, a man confronted with his sin, there we read over, what, two and a half thousand years ago, this man cried out, and there God had mercy. And here we are today reading the words that so bless us, so encourage us, so uplift us and strengthen us because there is mercy at the throne of God. So Moses saw, David fell on the mercy. And number three, Jeremiah wept for his mercy. Wept for his mercy. In the generations after David, Israel fell into a spiral of moral decline and how we live in a nation of moral decline. 
how we live in a generation of moral decline. No matter what sexuality it goes, whatever gender goes. In 587 BC, the Babylonians besieged and conquered and decimated the city of Jerusalem. It was one of the most horrific and awe-inspiring moments in the Old Testament. Jerusalem was laid barren. The city was famished and in desperate need to the point where even the women, even the mothers, boiled their children, sacrificed their children to keep alive. How this generation today sacrifices the young to keep alive because we walked away from our God. The Lamentations of Jeremiah, which are five just short chapters, is a tear-stained portrait of one of the once beautiful Jerusalem, now reduced to rubble. Jeremiah, the prophet, wept for the mercy of our God and King, the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, the city of the living God who Abraham offered up uh, on Mount Moriah. Abraham offered up Isaac. Is there where King David, Captain Joab, went and took the city of Jebus? It was a city that God had ordained as a city of the living God. Yet it was in decline. Yet it was the darkest time. But in that darkest time, in the darkest time, a man rose and wept. The prophet Jeremiah. In the darkest time, in the place of utter destruction, a man wept. In the place of loss, hurt, pain and shame, a man wept. He wept to see the mercy of God poured out on this nation again. He wept. He says in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Tears run down my eyes like the river. He says, I pour out my heart like water before the face of the Lord. My eyes flow and do not cease. Do our hearts weep for the mercy of God for our generation? Have we seen the mercy of God like Moses? Have we fell upon the mercy like David? Have we wept for the mercy like Jeremiah? Out of this heart of lament and weeping, and the pain where it was most exposed and hope seemed lost for this man and for this city and for this nation. It says, faith came bursting through. As a prophet gets a glimpse into the heart of God through his mercy. Because Jeremiah, a prophet, a prophet is a man who represents God before the people. He speaks on behalf of God to the people. And Jeremiah said this and he wept this and we know this all off by heart. We might not know where it is, but he said this. He says this, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers and sinks within me. But I call this to mind, he said. He said, therefore I have hope through the Lord's mercy we are not consumed. Because his mercies never come to the end. They are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. Yet he will show me compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. So Jeremiah, the prophet, the city was decimated, is run over. People were killing their own babies. It was, it was a most destructive era of Jerusalem and Israel's history. Yet there came a man who rose up and wept. There came a man who wept for the mercy of God and out of that came such hope because they are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. I believe Jeremiah was stunned as he saw it into the chambers of God's heart. There is mercy with God. There is mercy with God. And I know all of us at some stage have tasted and seen the mercy of God for our lives. Jeremiah was stunned. Have we tasted and seen that the Lord he is good? And finally, I mean, I can go into more detail, but finally, Jesus, the mercy of God revealed to us in flesh and blood. 
It says in Scripture, in the fullness of time, Christ came to dispense his glory, to dispense his mercy, to embody the mercies of our Savior, of our God and King. There must be payment for sin. A debt has to be paid. God looked for a man, it says in the scripture, he found no one. There was none righteous, no man, until Jesus. Not born of the will of man, but born by the will of God. Not under the law like every other man, yet he was born in that immaculate conception. John the Baptist cried, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away that sin. We see once a year on the Day of Atonement, which we know is Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter the holies of holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat of God and on the Ark of the Covenant seven times for his own sin and for the sins of the people and cover the sin so judgment would not come to Israel. In this holies of holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant where we say the mercy seat was. It was an object of worship, most significant time of worship in the Old Covenant. It was a box overlaid with gold in the most holy place. A golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's rod and the covenant law. It represents the priesthood, the law and the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. It was above the mercy seat between the cherubim of pure gold where God came down. We want the Lord to come down. We want the Lord to manifest his name. We want the Lord to manifest his glory. I want the Lord to manifest him in my home. I want him to manifest it in my heart. I want him to manifest among my children, my children's children. I want to have him manifest him in this nation and the nations of this world. So the nations of this world will become the nations of our God and King. They're his possession. The nations are his. The people are his. Amen. He came where he would, glory would rest and he would speak to Moses or speak to the high priest Aaron and speak to his people. It says in Exodus 25, it says, There I will meet you on the ark of testimony and there I will speak to you. But we see the repeated sacrifices of the high priest could never take away the sin. The repeated sacrifices only could cover the sin on the Day of Atonement, just once a year. But the most prominent request of Jesus in the scripture is this, Jesus, son of David, have what? Have mercy on me. That's the most, most prominent request in the New Testament. Jesus, have mercy on me. And I want to quickly, in the five minutes to go, look at three people, four people, quickly. A mother from Canaan, a mother, a mother whose daughter was ravished and possessed by evil spirits and suffering greatly, went to Jesus. Remember, the, 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 he says, come on, even, even, even the dogs eat crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus says, well, I haven't seen your great faith, but this great faith you have, your daughter is healed from this moment. And a mother came to Jesus asking for mercy for her daughter. And there Jesus poured out his love and kindness, his tender mercies, his compassion. A father came to Jesus whose son was having seizures, seizures and suffering greatly and he often fell into the fire and into the water. So a mother pleaded upon the mercy of God and Jesus healed. A father started to plead for the mercy of God for his son because he was demon possessed and suffered greatly and would often fall into the water and fall into the fire and yet, it says, Jesus had compassion and healed his son. There were two blind men of Je when Jesus was coming out of Jericho and doing his miracles. He came out of Jericho, and as he came out of Jericho, there was two blind men on the roadside. And they heard the kerfuffle. They heard that Jesus was passing by, and, Jesus, and they said to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have what? Have mercy on me. But it says, the multitudes quieted him down. Quieted him, hey, shush, blind men. They could have been brothers. They could have been blind all, all their life. They could have been blind from birth or they could have been blind because of an accident. Even so, there were two blind men. 
And they cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the multitudes hushed them down. But it says they cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And there, God, Jesus had compassion on them and moved with compassion and healed them. And finally, there was a man, and you know him very well. He doesn't give his name, but he, was, he lived on the other side of the Sea of Galilee on the land of the Gardeans. His name, some called him Legion because he was tormented day and night. He says it, he lived among the tombs. He lived among the tombs. Uh, I'm not too sure whether he was a father, whether he, um, definitely he was a son, whether he was a father, but he was, he was a father or a brother or someone. Whether he'd been tormented all of his life or maybe he went through some pain and hurt. Maybe he went through some difficulties in life and he just lost it all and there was in pain and suffering and there it says that he was ravished by not just one demon it says he was ravished by six thousand and they called him themselves legion and there jesus went over to that land it's the land of the gentiles so the unclean place and that's what the lord would like us to do go over to the unclean go over and jesus went over and there he healed that man and delivered the man from 6,000 tormenting spirits. And the, the spirits went into the swine didn't it? and the swine went over. And the people of the city, the people of the town said, Jesus, uh, this is our livelihood. You've now destroyed our livelihood. Please just go away and go back to the other side. And it says that the man followed Jesus and wanted to get into his boat. That's what he said. I think if, if I'd been delivered from much, I, I want to go and follow him much. And do you know what Jesus said to him, which we might seem a bit harsh, but Jesus says, no, don't get into my boat, mate. Don't get into my boat. Go to the ten cities around here and tell them of all the merciful things God has done for you. Amen. And the scripture says he went about all the ten cities preaching that Christ is full of mercy and sharing of the gospel of the kingdom because he had been loved much Therefore, he gave much. See, this man, I believe, was stunned. He was astonished. He was blown away. He was speechless by the mercy of God. We see, mercy always triumphs over the judgment as mercy expresses the very heart of Christ. Therefore, I want to be this as a church, as a people, as, as a person. I want to shout of the mercies of Christ from this place. No matter how stained you are, no matter how hurt you are, no matter how painful life has been to you, no matter how good or bad your sin has placed you in that position or through someone else's sin, or just because actually we live in life and tribulations and situations just happen in life. As you grow older, you think things just come to you. They come to you off the left field, right field, and sometimes it, all hell breaks loose in your life. Doesn't it? Or is it just me? We want to be a people, honestly, as Live Church. We want to be a church that embodies the mercy of Christ. No matter how stained your sin is, no matter how stained the sins that come in here, we will shout from the rooftops that God is merciful, gracious, full of compassion. Because mercy always triumphs over judgment. I've received such mercy from Christ. How can I judge another man's sin when I've received such grace and mercy? So we should pour out mercy upon the sinner, upon the offender, upon those who've hurt us, broken us, wounded us. I remember many times going, walking my dog, which I've shared before. It seems to be my work and my dog just weeping and crying, saying, thank you for your such grace upon my life. Thank you for such mercy upon my life. Thank you. And I would pray for those who are offended. We'd pray for those who hurt me. And I'd pray in such tears like Jeremiah wept as I fell like David and like I saw like Moses. So the Lord would like us to see his mercy, fall on his mercy and weep for his mercy like Jeremiah. Freely we have received, freely 
we extend mercy. I pray this morning that we would freely receive his gift of mercy. Mercy. Psalm is 136, 26 times the psalmist says, Lord, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy, your love and kindness, your tender mercies. Thank you for such mercy. 26 times the psalmist says, praise God for his mercy. As the people would go in front of Jehoshaphat, what did they cry? The Lord is good and his what? Mercy endures forever. Before the military, before all the, the host of the armies, his mercy endures forever. And God would then dispel the enemies before him because of his mercy, and because of his grace. And I pray that we would extend mercy because mercy is being extended to us. And as I finish in the last verse, I would say this. Let us be like the Apostle Paul who encouraged the church of Rome when they were going through their struggles. This, he said this, we are to make known the riches of his glory to all nations by becoming vessels of mercy. Let us be a people. Let us be a father. Let us be a son. Let us be a pastor. Let us be an employee. Let us be an employer. Let us be just a human man or woman that becomes and extends vessels of mercy to the hurting, to the broken, to the wounded, even those who have hurt you. Even though where you see their sin, and their sin is an offense to God, I'm not diminishing sin, but mercy is greater than sin. Mercy takes away sin. Mercy does not charge sin. Mercy covers, takes away, prays, upholds, strengthens, encourages helps mercy of God. Let us be like Moses who saw his mercy. Lord, show me your glory, Lord, and he will show you it. Let us be like David that fell on his mercy when we see our own sin. Let it be not be confronted by someone else, but let it be as we spend time in prayer. The Lord shows us, and there we can fall upon this mercy, exposed to no man, except for the man Christ Jesus is willing and ready to reach out and cleanse and make whole and make new. And let us be like Jeremiah as we see our nation, as we see our family, as we see our friends, as we see our neighbours, and we weep for the mercy of Christ, which are new every morning, and great is his faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're the mercy of God revealed in flesh. That Jesus, you bore our sin, which was an offense to God, that no man could come to you. No man was worthy to come to you unless they recovered. When they poured out that sin, the blood of the innocent lamb upon the ark of the covenant, your glory came and you would speak to the high priest. And Jesus, we know you're the high priest. That you went into the heavens to the true tabernacle, not made with the hands of man, but made in heaven. And there you sprinkled your blood upon the mercy of the Father. And now that blood forever speaks of a new and living way which you've opened up to us. That the blood speaks into the whole of this world, into the whole of our hearts, into the byways and byways to compel people. There is mercy at the throne of God and it's embodied in the life and the person of Jesus Christ. And the Father, I thank you for such mercy poured out upon our hearts and upon our homes, and upon our sons, and upon our daughters, upon our friends, upon our neighbors, upon our nation, upon the nations of the world that you're coming back for a glorious church that shouts from the rooftops, mercy, mercy, mercy. While there's time, while it's called today, there's mercy at the throne of God. 
Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know I went a bit long. Forgive me that. I know Paula, who's overseeing the kids out there, is probably extending mercy to me. Is that right, Virginia? Uh, hallelujah. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Lee Roberts will be preaching on Wednesday. He, he, he is a result. He went to Afghanistan. He nearly died in Afghanistan. Uh, he's a true man of God, a true anointed man of God. I honor him greatly and his family, the Yolanda and the kids. So come on and listen to Lee. He always has a good word to us. And uh, I probably haven't got time now. We better dismiss everyone, should we? Hallelujah. Yeah, it's just missed everyone. Thanks for coming. Pastor Rob will be back next Sunday. Uh, come and see Vincent Lee and let's, let's extend mercy. Amen. 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 Amen.